Hello, and welcome to a sunny book nook. I have my lavender earrings on, my lavender mug with some Earl Grey tea. Earl Grey is the best tea. Fight me. My name is Sunny, and today I am going to be giving you my in-depth analysis and review of The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. This book is, I would say, my favorite sci-fi novel of all time. It is absolutely brilliant and I have a bit of a political analysis for you in my review of this book. I made a video a couple weeks or months ago at this point talking about how I really wanted to make this video a in-depth review analysis of this text as a black Marxist anti-colonial piece of work in the speculative fiction genre. So. I'm gonna do that. Just to preface with my background regarding science fiction and speculative fiction, I didn't really start reading this genre until maybe early 2020, so I'm somewhat new to the genre, but I've read so much of it since then that I feel like I feel like I have the authority to talk about this. Also, um, my laptop is right here, so I have a bunch of notes and quotes and stuff pulled up, so if I'm looking this direction, it is because I'm reading this. I really didn't like the idea of science fiction before I read this book. It was my first introduction to the genre really and it's really set the tone and set my expectations for what I want out of reading this genre since. I think that this book sort of showed me the way that I perceived science fiction as something that was predominantly like white men writing about their fantasies and the ways that like their utopias or criticisms, I don't know. I, it was very like Tolkien, Star Wars type shit is what I thought of it as. And I just have never really had an interest in that type of shit. But as I read this book and as I explored the genre further, I kind of started to understand what it does as a genre. Adrienne Marie Brown said, all organizing is science fiction. We are bending the future together into something we have never experienced. A world where everyone experiences abundance, access, pleasure, human rights, dignity, freedom, transformative justice, peace. We long for this. We believe it is possible. I think that is one of the primary purposes of speculative fiction, sci-fi fantasy, is creating new worlds. But those new worlds and those alternative worlds also function as ways to criticize the current one and to make them fantasy. Because ultimately all of human history is narrative and narrative is fantasy, it's storytelling. One of the people who is the primary example of women science fiction fantasy authors is Ursula Le Guin. And she also said, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words. And I think that those are the two quotes I want to preface this video with because that is the purpose of my political analysis and observations based off of this world. So let's just get into it. Also, there's going to be spoilers all throughout. This video is intended for people who have already read this book, not as a way to pitch this book to other people. So yeah, if you haven't read this book already, go read it. It's fantastic, obviously. It's it's one of the best. It, it won the Hugo Award and every other book after this book in the series. It's a trilogy, also won the Hugo Award. Fucking phenomenal. Anyway, I'm going to define some political terms. First, material conditions. What is the reality of the world? What are the material objects that the world functions around? And how do those material things, the things like money and, you know, human bodies and resource, natural resources in the earth, how do these things interact with each other? That is a material, that those are material conditions. And I think that material conditions in the sci-fi fantasy universe and world and genre operate as world building. And the world building in this book is mind blowing. This is what the stillness looks like. And I think that the tone of this book and the writing style is what also makes it so special because N.K. Jemisin says in the basically within the first few chapters of the book we live on this place called the stillness but it's not still even on a good day and that is sort of the contradiction of this world and of 
like the names within it. And I think that's another common theme throughout this novel. Names are very, very important. And I'll get more into that later. And there's far more other elements of the world building in here and the different identities and roles people have, which is another part of like material conditions, like the occupations that people have and the ways that pe people spend their time and utilize resources and also the ways that people transform resources and using their labor power. Now let's get into another political term that I'm going to be using throughout this video. Dialectical and historical materialism. First of all, go read the 1938 Stalin piece titled Dialectical and Historical Materialism if you haven't already. I'll link it in the description, of course. It's available on marxist.org. It is very short. It's a short article that sort of fully defines dialectical and historical materialism. To Hegel, the process of thinking which, under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject. It is the creator of the real world, and the real world is only the external, phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing less than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. You don't need to know what the Hegelian method is or whatever, but Marx is saying that ideas arise from the world around us. That's the dialectics. The materialism is like the real world around us. And I obviously already talked to you what like material conditions are, right? The materialism is like the wall, this book, labor power these are the realities of the world people and like what people look like and how they move around and how like the fact that what we do and what we see what we feel and how the world actually operates how the world operates is what creates the ideas and mechanisms and ideologies by which the world then functions and it works to sort of perpetuate itself i'll show you a little graph here that sort of talks about the base and the superstructure, the base being the economic material conditions of the world and the superstructure being the ideological media and art forms and family structures and culture and whatever that arises from it. And I think that we can see this concept illustrated very directly and very clearly throughout this book. Throughout the course of this novel, at the end of each chapter, there is an excerpt of stone lore. And stone lore in this world functions as almost a survival guide that is imposed onto everyone. And I would argue that the survival guide within this book functions as the dialectics of the materialism of this world. Because the material reality of this world is that it is constantly moving and shaking and there are constantly these fifth seasons that completely destroy civilizations. And that's why the world is separated into these different communities called comms, as well as different races of people, with the Sanzed Empire being the dominant race. And we can see how N.K. Jemisin really plays with the idea of phenotypical features and race throughout this novel in the way that our characters describe each other and their perception of other people. And of course, there is the magical element of the origins, which also really shake up the material conditions of this world because they literally can change the earth with the power that is innate to them. It is not something that they earn, but it is part of their human biology. And because it is part of their human biology, they are deeply, deeply hated, persecuted, and marginalized within society. I think that because all of our main characters who all are the same person, but who are all different people because they're different stages of, you know, one person's life, obviously. The fact that the dedication page N.K. Jemisin gives us is for all those who have to fight for the respect that everyone else is given without question. I think that also reveals another one of Jemisin's intentions of this book and the intentions within the creation and the world building of orogenic power. As origins, they embody dialectical materialism in that they can change and be in conversation with the earth. They can change the material realities of the world around them at the drop of a hat. And it's not because of any necessarily active decisions on their part, because very young children can accidentally destroy whole cities due to a spurt of anger. Because they can be such major threats to civilization operating in the very tight controlled way that it has to because of the fact that 
at any point a fifth season could arrive and destroy all of civilization and the entire earth as they know it in order to stabilize this world and to ensure that there are fewer unexpected elements to this world, the powers that be and thus the ideology reproduced and disseminated to the masses is one that deeply fears origins and despises them because they can change their world in a way that like these humans have the ability to change their world in a way that no one else does because the actual world, the stone, the earth, the crust, people really don't have any control over. And in this world, we see all the different ways that people try to cope with the ever shifting realities of the stillness. They create comms, they create systems of inclusion and exclusion of who is allowed in and who is pushed out. And the people who are not in comms, people who are origins are essentially left for dead during the season. And because that is the brutality of survival, to survive in a brutal world is to brutalize others in order to maintain a sense of stability, essentially. I think this book really reveals to us. I think that the stone lore represents the ideology of this world reflecting the material conditions and in conversation with the material reality and economic and like base of the world because we can see here that dialectical materialism kind of reveals to us that human perception is limited. It's limited by what we no, because you don't know what you don't know. There's no way of knowing what you don't know, which is why, for example, in Tablet 2 of The Incomplete Truth, as seen on page 41 at the very end of the chapter, where, you know, it's another excerpt of Stone Lore, it says, The ice white eyes, the ash blow hair, the filtering nose, the sharpened teeth, the salt split tongue. That is the explanation of a stone eater. But really, they have no other understanding of what stone eaters are and what they can do because later in the chapters later in the book we find out that any time that the government or the fulcrum which I, I will get into later because when they try to study the the stone eaters they just fucking destroyed the whole city so you you don't know what you don't know and you fear what you don't know and that's another element of why origins are so deeply feared like there's no way of ultimately controlling them but there are forces that try very hard to and are successful in doing so such as the fulcrum another super structural element of the base material conditions of this world is the lorist tales so for example on page 115 this is a excerpt from the Loris recitation called The Making of the Three Peoples, part one. Listen, listen well. There was an age before the seasons when life and earth, its father, thrived alike. Life had a mother, too. Something terrible happened to her. Earth, our father, knew he would need clever life, so he used the seasons to shape us out of animals. Clever hands for making things and clever minds for solving problems and kept clever tongues for working together and clever sesapine to warn us of danger. The people became what Father Earth needed, and then more than he needed. Then we turned on him, and he has burned with hatred for us ever since. Remember, remember what I tell. This is sort of a folkloric explanation of the reason why seasons happen, and it also pushes the blame onto those with Sesapine origins. And it's coming from this voice of like us, and we turned on him, he burned with hatred for us. There's this intention that is projected onto the earth, which objectively you have no understand. Like the stillness is just the stillness. It is just the place that they happen to live. But human understanding gives reasoning to things that otherwise are just objective realities, which is what dialectical materialism is ultimately all about. Another element of I think Marxist analysis that can be applied here is the idea of like who has power. And throughout this book, we see that for origins, the forces of power that attempt to control them is the fulcrum. And within the fulcrum, there is a bureaucracy and hierarchy. And the fulcrum is run by guardians who act as the caretakers and enforcers of the origins. But throughout this book, we learn to hate the guardians, especially Shafa. We see from the first element, like from the first time that they meet, that 
he is grooming her. He is grooming her not in a sexual way, but ultimately in a way that has to do with controlling and limiting her power. He breaks her hand to break her. And that is a common, that is like a, a rite of passage for all orogenic children who get brought into the fulcrum. And the fulcrum trains these children to become tools of the empire. But most of the origins do not see themselves as tools of the empire because the fulcrum and the life the fulcrum provides is really the only alternative. It's their only option besides, you know, being persecuted and on the run and chased and murdered their entire lives by non orogenic humans. Because the fulcrum is sort of what allows origins to not have experience like a mass genocide because it cages them and submits them into a place of use for other comms, we also see how the comms like and people actually need origins. They need this orogenic power to control the forces that they otherwise would have no control over. As we see when Alabaster and Cyanite get called over to the city of Alia to try to get rid of this coral situation, this coral buildup. And the way that the government folks treat them is a, sort of a reflection of the anti-orogenic ideology that predominates the society due to the material conditions of the world. But obviously the way that they are hated is not justified because it is completely, it does not make sense. Because at the end of the day, oppression doesn't make sense. Class society doesn't make sense. Racial difference doesn't make sense. Gender difference doesn't make sense. These are all false constructs that are used to justify the oppression of certain people. And it has to do with the world that you live in. The history of how that culture came to be and how it perpetuates itself from generation to generation. I think a good example of this is the story of Miselem, which Shafa tells Demaya on his on their trip to the fulcrum when she is being taken away from her family. He tells her the story of Miselem, which is about an origin, you know, many, many century millennia ago during the rise and conquering of the Sanzed Empire. The story was basically saying that Miselem was going around destroying all these cities and came up to the capital and the like lady emperor at the time basically he she knew that he was going to come up her, there and try to kill her so she dug up all of the earth all around the city and like just made sure that none of the orogenic power that he would have been able to use would have been possible to use against her because she was so clever in doing that she saved the day from the this evil origin who was trying to destroy the world for no reason and kill her. And we can see in that chapter, Demaya sort of coming to realize, coming to understand that she is not the protagonist of that story. She is Miselem. She is the villain. But then many chapters later, when we are in Cyanite's perspective, her relationship to Alabaster, I think, is the process of understanding the world, deprogramming your mind from colonial capitalist propagandist logic. And because of this deprogramming she's going through, it's very uncomfortable for Cyanite. And that's why she finds it so difficult to be with Alabaster and hang out with him and work with him. Alabaster is already functioning at this level of being a tent ringer, being someone who has basically fully mastered orogenic power beyond the scope of which the fulcrum even understands. So because of that, and because he is so deeply familiar with the nature of the fulcrum and the bureaucratic powers and the ways that he's been used time and time again, he is incredibly jaded and he opposes the fulcrum as an institution, as he should, because of the way that it has exploited him. Alabaster has a deep, violent and justified anger towards the fulcrum and the way that the world treats origins. And he is trying to reveal that truth and show the reality of their world to Cyanite bit by bit through like teaching her what he knows of his powers through being hesitant and bitchy and throwing fits. 
He acts this way because he's deeply sensitive, because the world has beaten him so much. But Cyanite, at this point in her role, in her identity as Cyanite, she's still ultimately trying to barrel through life and succeed within the bureaucracy, within the structure of the fulcrum itself, because that is within the limitations of her knowledge. That is the extent to which she can understand what the world can look like for her. The, her best option is to be a slave to the fulcrum. And she doesn't see it that way because the fulcrum doesn't present itself that way, but it ultimately is. Like a, a gilded cage is still a cage. And that's what the fulcrum is for origins. And it's a way to control them and use them as almost a controlled substance for the rest of the world, while the rest of the world can continue to exploit them while also hating them. And, you know, obviously that's saying a lot of things about exploitation, class, and race that Jemison is ultimately saying here, right? There's that very, very clear analogy of the fact that if there's a group of people whose labor is being used and exploited and controlled through these very strict forces, but in society they are still widely hated despite being ultimately necessary for the operation of said society because they are seen as a threat to the operation of said society due to the nature of their being, what does that even look like? What does that mean? How, how does that work? And that's what this book is ultimately, I think, answering the question to. Because Sinai is kind of going through the process of deprogramming in her relationship to Alabaster, as we see, Alabaster turns to her and at one point explains to her, you know the story of Misalem? So the reality of the Miselin story, and he knows this because he spent a lot of his time as like a ch child orogenic prodigy. He didn't really have a lot of work time when he was in the fulcrum. He just sort of like went into the library and read a bunch of shit. According to the actual history of the, of the Sanzid Empire, what actually happened was that during the season that the Sanzid Empire and the Miselin story was undergoing, the Sanzids because they're like at this point all the store caches are run through there's no more actual like food to eat they started cannibalizing other races of people so they the sansid empire would you know eat humans who were not sansid and that is kind of where the racial hierarchy of this world even comes from which makes sense because in the real world meaning the world that we live in racial hierarchies also emerge from the reality of exploitation that is just like it's is a justification of human a false human hierarchy right and so because the Sanzid empire was destroying other communities and you know eating them Miselem was very angry because his whole family had been eaten by the Sanzids so he went around destroying the Sanzids and tried to take revenge on them but ultimately failed as the queen emperor lady brought him to bondage. This story and the way that it was told to Demaya from Shafa, her guardian, versus the way that Alabaster tells Cyanite this same story, shows the way that narratives are used to uphold and justify the material conditions of the world that you live in. If media, art, and storytelling is the superstructure of a world, it is constantly in conversation with and a result of the material base. And in this world, it is not only just, you know, the actual earth itself and stillness, but it's also part of the material conditions and part of the reality of an economic base is technology. And magic is a form of technology, especially in this world. So it's like a tool that you can use and it can also be incredibly destructive. So orogenic power ultimately is a form of the base of, you know, this base superstructure system of any world that you can apply this you can apply the base superstructure system and analysis onto any world essentially but in this world the orogenic power it, it, as the material base creates the m social ideology that this story the misalem story arrives from and it is a commonly told and known story and just one element of the many 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 extensive elements of culture that exist to justify the denigration of origins to sort of make a comparative analysis between the fifth season and Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, I wanted to read some quotes from The Wretched of the Earth that I think pertain so well to this story. 
For a colonized people, the most essential value, because the most concrete, is first and foremost the land. The land which will bring them bread and above all, dignity. This is obviously talking about colonial domination of the continent of Africa. That's what Fanon is writing about. But in this book, I think it is incredibly apt because at the very beginning, the prologue, we see Alabaster, he's not named yet because we don't know him as a character by that point of the, at the very beginning of the book. Alabaster breaks the earth. He takes land that is his because he has control over it and uses it to bring him dignity because uh, there are conversations throughout the novel where cyanite and alabaster are having conversations and of course cyanite is the pessimistic one and she views alabaster as like absolutely insane for the majority of their relationship despite and because of the fact that alabaster knows far more than her because he he's a ten bringer and he is you know he is her mentor and also by the very end of the book, like on the literal last page of the book, we are in Asun's perspective and Asun is in the second uh, point of view, like the second perspective, like you, right? So you stare at him speechless. Then he leans forward, uh, blah, 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 blah. He grins again and suddenly it hits you, evil eating earth. He's not crazy at all. And he never has been. Tell me, he says, have you ever heard of something called a moon? So that the fact that those are the last sentences of this book finally shows us the way that by the time we get to the very end of the book and by the time we are in Asu's perspective and she finally meets up with Alabaster again, she realizes that he has never been crazy. She was the one who was ignorant the whole time. For revolutionaries and for people who believe in a different world than the one that we live in now, and a better world for everyone than the one that we live in now, you are seen as absolutely insane because it is inconceivable to think of a world beyond yours. And people are very offended by it. People are very aghast at the suggestion, at the idea. They will poke holes into any of your suggestions, as we see in Cyanite's chapters with Alabaster. She is like, he's like, okay, but what if we live in a world where we don't have to have these torturous node maintainers and us being subjugated in this way? And she's like, well, that's never gonna happen, so. And that's, you know, around the midpoint of the book. Like, their imaginations are limited by the oppression that you experience. That's the superstructural base relationship. If the material conditions and reality that you live in limit your understanding of the potential of a world, then the dialectics kind of recreate that and perpetuate that. I also think that throughout the novel, the fact that the sky is never really discussed or it is ignored because everyone is so concerned with the reality of the earth, it kind of shows how material conditions like the actual obelisks in the sky, the literal, like, <laughs> like the literal floating celestial objects, in the sky are largely ignored within this book by the masses of people because they are so focused on trying to survive on a day-to-day -day level that they're, no one's looking up. Everyone's looking down to make sure they're not gonna get eaten alive by the earth. And there is a really interesting chapter that sort of explains this. And also at the very beginning of the book as well, within the first couple chapters, N.K. Jemisin also plants that sort of idea in our mind where she literally says most people are not concerned with the sky. They are concerned with the earth and the reality of the earth, which makes sense because that is ultimately what people are having to deal with to survive every day. But when you are focused so much on survival, like your imagination is a even more limited by the reality of your world. You can't think beyond it. You're trying so hard to not die. I think Jemison is also a masterful, masterful foreshadower because we know everything that's going to happen by the end of the story within the first chapter of the book. We know, we know that the stillness has been destroyed by one man and we see the process by which we got there 
the interlude that I'm talking about that I find so interesting that on a first read, most people will ignore. Most people will not really, th that's not what sticks out in their mind. What sticks out in their mind is like all the crazy shit that you're seeing happen and all the horrible things you're seeing happen because the extremes are what reveal a lot to people at first glance. But it is those subtle, less noticeable elements of both the book and our world that actually reveal to us the solutions to our problems and also the potentials for other worlds. So in the interlude, page 150. No one in the stillness speaks of islands. That is not because islands do not exist or are uninhabited, quite the contrary. It is because islands tend to form near faults or atop hotspots, which means there are ephemeral things in the planetary scale. There with an eruption and gone with the next tsunami. But human beings too are ephemeral things in the planetary scale. The number of things that they do not notice are literally astronomical. The fact that she says literally astronomical is so, it, it's, it just tickles me because, I mean, yeah, it's true. And also again, reveals the limits of human perception, which is what dialectical materialism is all about, right? Like the material reality that exists, it, like what you choose to observe is what creates the worldview that you have. People in the stillness don't really think about the islands and that creates, that makes the islands almost a safe haven for origins because no one's thinking about them, which is why we see the, the happiest point of this book is when alabaster and cyanide are on the island and are finally having good sex, finally being treated as human beings, finally being treated as worthy, but at the same time, they are still being hunted and they do get hunted and found out. At the same time, are still being used because the reason why these people on the island can even live is because they use orogenic power to survive in a way that isn't so controlled, exploitative, and fucked up the way the fulcrum does. The fulcrum with its node maintainers and its bureaucracy and its absolute breaking and grooming of every single origin that it takes in, the island doesn't do that at all. But the island still like needs origins to, to survive. And for a while, it is a mutually beneficial relationship. One where people who are origins are respected and treasured because they are valuable, as opposed to shunned and hated by larger society because they are seen as a threat. People in the stillness do not speak of other continents either, though it is plausible to suspect that they might exist anywhere, elsewhere. No one has traveled around the world to see that there aren't any. Seafaring is dangerous enough with resupply in sight and tsunami waves that are only a hundred feet high rather than the legendary mountains of water said to ripple across the unfettered deep ocean. They simply take as a given that the bit of lore passed down from braver civilizations that say that there's nothing else. We see the limitations of the human perception. We, because of the material conditions of like tsunamis and the threats of tr seafaring, no one has thought to or tried to, or, you know, taken, taken the risk to attempt trying to see whether there's any other continents besides the stillness. And because it is taken as fact that the stillness is the only continent, that is how the world operates. Even if there are other continents, it doesn't affect the way that these people in the stillness work, like work because it doesn't seem to matter to them. They can't think of any other option besides immediate survival because it's been so pressed upon throughout their lives. Then it says, Likewise, no one speaks of celestial objects, though the skies are as crowded and busy here as anywhere else in the universe. This is largely because so much of the people's attention is directed towards the ground, not the sky. They notice what's there, stars and the sun and the occasional comet or falling star. They, they do not know what's missing. And that's the moon foreshadowing. But then how can they? Who misses what they have never ever even imagined? That would not be human nature. How fortunate then that there are more people in the world in this world than just humankind. The limitations of human perception and expectations are challenged by the material reality of stone eaters in this world. The stone eater element of this story kind of is is what drives a lot of what happens. Hoa helps Esun try to find her daughter. And the stone eater at the very beginning of the book is alongside Alabaster when he breaks the earth. And basically, I think what the at the end of the day, what this book ultimately shows us and says is that 
in order for change to happen, in order for a better world for everyone to exist, you need to destroy an old one. You need to break that earth. And there's a lot of suffering that happens due to, but considering the amount of suffering that the people have enacted onto others throughout the course of that. And here are some other quotes from Wretched of the Earth that I think are very applicable in this story. The settler makes history and is conscious of making it. And because he constantly refers to the history of his mother country, he clearly indicates that he himself is the extension of that mother country. Thus, the history which he writes is not the history of the country which he plunders, but the history of his own nation in regards to all that she skims off, all that she violates and starves. And that is literally an explanation of the Sanzid Empire and how it operates as. And if the Sanzids are the settlers and the colonizers, then they control the narrative. They control history. They write history. That's why the stone lore is how the stone lore is. And Alabaster even challenges that being like, there's more than the stone lore. How do you know that the stone lore is like right? How do you know that that's true? And when they first had that conversation, Sinai is like, what the fuck? Like, of course it's true. Like, duh, duh. But that's a thing. Things that are universally accepted as truths in our world is, it is just a result of the material reality. It is the super structural element of the base function of society. It is the dialectics of the materialism. It is not itself like an absolute truth. It's just been perpetuated as such due to the nature of ideology emerging from the material world. Then another Wretched of the Earth, Franz Fanon quote. Once their rage explodes, there being the colonizers, they recover their lost coherence. They experience self-knowledge through reconstruction of themselves. From afar, we see their war as the triumph of barbarity, but it proceeds on its own to gradually emancipate the fighter and progressively eliminate the colonial darkness inside and out. As soon as it begins, it is merciless. Either one must remain terrified or become terrifying, which means surrendering to the dissociations of a fabricated life or conquering the unity of one's native soil. When the peasants lay hands on a gun, the old myths fade, and one by one the taboos are overturned. A fighter's weapon is his humanity, for in the first phase of the revolt, killing a European is killing two birds with one stone, eliminating in one go oppressor and oppressed, leaving one man dead and the other man free. I think that perfectly embodies the way that Alabaster breaks the earth and how Origines can rebel against the empire, against their the control of them inf inflicted and enacted by the guardians and by the fulcrum and by the Sanzid empire and by the world around them. Their colonizers, the ones who dominate them, how they interact with origins is inherently violent. It's constantly enacted violence as we see throughout the entirety of this book. So when Asun fights back with violence and we can see this from the very beginning of the book where Asun starts like as the first chapter in the first perspective she is pursuing her husband for murdering her child and she wants to kill him that is her goal it's it's the violence of the oppressed against the oppressor it comes when the, their rage explodes they recover their lost coherence we see that in how cyanite and alabaster work in this world Finally, the last Wretched of the Earth quote I want to point out is, In the colonial countries, on the contrary, the policeman and the soldier, by their immediate presence and their frequent and direct action, maintain contact with the native and advise him by means of rifle butts and napalm not to budge. It is obvious here that the agents of government speak the language of pure force. And that also parallels and embodies the guardians entirely. They use pure force and violence and bureaucracy the actual act of hurting and disciplining these children for colonial control, for, for a limitation of their imagination and a limitation of their freedom and reality. So yeah, that is sort of my Marxist anti-colonial analysis of the fifth season. I There's probably a lot more other things that I didn't cover in this video, despite it already being so long. And if it's incoherent, I'm really sorry. <sighs> This will be hell to edit because I don't know how much sense I made even, but I hope I hope this was interesting to you and I hope it wasn't too rambly and off focus. But yeah, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for watching. Um, like, comment, subscribe, you know, if you haven't already. And you can follow me on my social media, friend me on Goodreads, etc. That stuff is always in the description box down below.
and I will see you in my next video. Bye!